me fix, get everything fixed up here right quick. Full screen speaker. Okay. All right, my name is Kwame Abdul Bay. I am the, one of the co-conveners of the Arkansas Peace and Justice Memorial Movement. Uh, we have partnered with the National Office of coming to the tables to bring to you guys uh, this film screening, uh, followed by what is now a uh, panel discussion. Uh, the film Ashes to Ashes was a very moving film, a very, it got to some truths in just the 26 minutes that uh, it, uh, of its length, it got to, some really serious truths that we want to get to here in the panel discussion. And I want to go ahead and start by introducing uh, the members of the panel. Uh, we have Sheila Moss Brown, we have Stephanie Harp, and we have Karen Brennan. And I want to give each of these uh, ladies an opportunity to introduce themselves and uh, let everybody know why they're here. Let's go ahead and start with Sheila Moss Brown. Hi, everyone. Um, I'm here because my grandfather was Henry Peg Gilbert. Um, he lived in Georgia, in the LaGrange area, Harris County, and he was lynched in 1947. Um, he was a prosperous farmer, and um, rumors are that the people of the town wanted his land, and um, was unhappy that a black man had accomplished so much. And uh, one day he was a deacon at the church. He was inside the church and a, um, a, a black man had run over a calf in the road. And the calf was owned by Olin Sands. And Olin Sands had threatened um, Gus Davison, the black man that ran the calf over in the road. And Gus Davison, the black man shot the white man. And of course, Chaos ensued, Gus Davison got out of town, and so they arrested my grandfather and accused him of harboring um, Gus Davison. And in turn, um, after three or four days of him being arrested, he was found dead in his cell. So he was lynched. And so it's interesting because before hearing about my grandfather, I always thought lynch was hung. And so now understanding that lynching actually just means a mob killing. Um, so um, that's one of the reasons I'm here. This film was powerful. I know we'll get into it, into the details of it. And of course, I saw a lot of similarities that I um, love to discuss once we get into the topic. And one, one of the other characteristics of a lynching is uh, it is uh, a complicit uh, state action, uh, and it might be uh, complicit uh, from a uh, uh, from an implied perspective or from an actual perspective. Uh, so that's that's one thing. It's, it's state sponsored terrorism. That's that's the best way to uh, mm -hmm. let people today, especially the young people that don't understand, is you know when I tell them I say this. When I let them know it's state-sponsored terrorism, then they're able to uh, uh, equate it with the things that they know today. Uh, Karen, how are you doing this evening? I'm doing well. Thank you, Kwame, and Please thank you for yourself. Thank you for doing this. Um, so this is the fourth time I've watched this film, and uh, it doesn't get any easier. Uh, but each time I watch it, it, it enlightens me uh, to some things that I hadn't thought about before. Um, I uh, started going down to Harris County, Georgia, which is where Sheila's grandfather was Lynch, um, in 1995, uh, looking for answers uh, to questions I had had for a long time. Um, and it took me about 20, 25 years to get, to get enough answers to satisfy me um, and to get, the gut, get up the guts to write about it. Um, and I discovered four kinds of lynchings that took place over a uh, period of time from slavery to, to the 1940s, the last one 
I discovered was that of Sheila's grandfather. Um, and the first kind was the kind we always think about, which is the out of doors, uh, you know, everybody shows up and that kind of thing. Uh, and, that, and, and, and I found one of those and that was in 1912. And um, that was one in which my grandfather was the deputy. He was only 21 years old at the time. He was the deputy sheriff. His father was the sheriff. His father got out of Dodge uh, because the mob, who were all his kinfolks, of course, told him to. Uh, and my grandfather oversaw it. And uh, my grandfather spent the rest of his uh, time as sheriff. I mean, he didn't remain sheriff after that, he, but he became sheriff again in 1933 and was sheriff for 26 years. And he was sheriff when Sheila's grandfather uh, was lynched. And he was responsible because he turned his back and let it happen. His job was to ensure the safety of prisoners. That's what he swore on the Bible to do. And uh, he, I'm sure, knew this was going on, even though he told Justice Department officials that he didn't. Um, and then he lied about it. Um, he backed up the police chief who uh, who took the rap for it. We'll never know exactly who did it and how they did it and where they did it. There's still a lot of questions out there. But we do know that uh, Mr. Gilbert was brutally uh, tortured before he was murdered. And the claim of the police chief mm -hmm. was that he, he had to kill him in self-defense, which is uh, laughable. Uh, and my grandfather, the sheriff, uh, said, yeah, that's what happened, and told that to the Justice Department. And, and so they dropped it. Um, that was uh, another kind of lynching, but I call it a jailhouse lynching. Uh, the other two kinds of lynchings were the private lynchings, uh, which we'll never have all the names of, of those people. And um, I found a box in the basement of the Harris County Courthouse uh, called, uh, labeled, uh, Parties un Unknown, Parties Unknown. There were at least 20 uh, coroner's reports of bodies found tied up in the Chattahoochee River that had uh, come out of the Chattahoochee River, uh, mostly black and clearly uh, un <laughs> not drownings. Uh, I mean, they may have been drownings, but they, they, their hands and their feet were tied. So when we say that there were 4,000 people of record lynched uh, during this particular period of time, uh, I always think of those 20 other people in her in one county and think if it's that way in every county, then how many were really were really lynched? Um, so uh, I spent a lot of time. Uh, I wrote about several lynchings in Harris County and elsewhere um, in this book. Family tree. I, um, When I heard about this film, I realized that Cuthbert was an hour's drive from Harris County. Uh, Mr. Rembert's uh, near lynching took place about 22 years after Sheila's grandfather's lynching. Uh, I was six years old when Peg Gilbert was, was lynched by my grandfather's best friend, the police chief, with his, you know, with his permission. Um, I was 26 years old, 28 years old, when this happened. This isn't history. I mean, this is, uh, you know, this is my lifetime. This is many, many people in this audience's lifetimes. Um, I'm thinking to myself, uh, you know, there have been, um, Stepping back a minute, when I started looking into this, I didn't know where to go. I didn't know anybody doing this kind of work um, at the time. This is, we're talking 1993, 1994. Mm -hmm. uh, I eventually found Coming to the Table, uh, which was a, it, it was and is a marvelous organization that brings black folks and white people together uh, who have common histories and helps us to find each other. And I was able to find a, a magnificent family of African-Americans who were descended from people that my people had enslaved in Harris County. Um, and some of them are, are listening to me today. And so I just wanna give a shout out to, 
Deborah and to Christopher. Um, Christopher is about 11 years old and he plans to become a um, United States Senator from the great state of Georgia one of these days. So remember that name. Mm -hmm. <laughs> um, so, you know, in, in the process, I began to, um, the, one of the first memorial services I ever heard about for lynching victims was this service that is in this film that Dr. Whitaker uh, put on. This, this was held a lot, I, I, I don't know what year, but it's, it's been quite some time. She was a pioneer. And, you know, uh, that inspired me. So I spent years and years and years trying to talk the good people of Hamilton, Georgia into having a memorial service for the four people uh, in 1912. And, and that's a whole other story. And we did end up, uh, in fact, there have been numerous memorial services uh, for Mr. Gilbert and for other people. Uh, you know, there have been apologies by the police chief of uh, LaGrange, Georgia. Uh, there was an apology by the sheriff of Harris County, which shocked us all, and, and we're grateful for that, um, for Mr. Gilbert's uh, murder. So, you know, there's a movement going on in this country, uh, and, and, and so much of it has been sparked by individuals who have been kind of out there, you know, working on individual cases. Um, and now we're finding each other. And Brian Stevenson in EJI has been, you know, has been a wonderful galvanizer uh, of, of all the district groups and individuals all around the country. And not just in the South, because this is not just a Southern problem. Um, so we're finding each other and uh, we're, we're now moving, a lot of us are moving toward reparations uh, for descendants of lynching victims. Uh, as well as descendants of enslaved people. Uh, so maybe at some point, uh, Kwame, you can put on the chat um, the link for a uh, conference on this coming Tuesday, the uh, Civil Rights and Restorative Justice Project of Northeastern University Law School really uh, Ha, but deserves more credit for unearthing the story of Henry Peg Gilbert than I do. They really, mm -hmm. those students really got the story and did it and did it a great, did a great job. Um, and they have put together a um, a documentary, which I hope will be showing some sometime on your program here. Indeed, uh, yes, indeed. Which anybody this is just can the beginning. Right now, you can just go on Google the lynching of Henry Peg Gilbert. Uh, and, and, and watch it and show it to other people. So that's enough from me for right now. Indeed. And could all of the uh, panelists please make sure that you either close out the window with OV or turn the volume off on that window so there is no feedback. Uh, our next person that's uh, talking with us today uh, is Stephanie Harp. Uh, Sheila and Karen, they have a connected history because um, of their families being tied to one specific instance of racial terror lynching. Myself and Stephanie, we also have that type of history. So I'm gonna go ahead and introduce Stephanie Harp. How are you doing? Hi Kwame, nice to see you again. Hi Sheila and Karen, um, thanks. So our, yeah, our tie is, it's a very complicated story. Uh, so I'll try to tell it as, as succinctly as I can. Um, in April of 1927, the Great Mississippi Valley flood came down and hit Little Rock. And a little girl, white girl, 11-year-old white girl disappeared. And people thought she drowned or they didn't know what had happened to her. There was all kind of speculation that she'd been kidnapped or something. And there was a massive search for her that lasted for several weeks. And then... Um, Three weeks later, they found her body. So now we're up to April 30th. Oh, I guess that's two weeks. Anyway, um, we found her body in the belfry of the First Presbyterian Church in downtown Little Rock. And that was a, a fashionable white church at the time. And um, immediately they arrested Frank Dixon, who was the janitor at the church, African-American man. 
And almost immediately after that, his son, his teenage son, Lonnie, who was 16, under suspicion of um, having killed and hidden the, killed this little girl, Floella, and hidden her body. There's a bunch of circumstantial evidence, um, a lot of clues that didn't match up when you, I mean, I've delved deeply into the newspapers at the time, the, the, um, the two Little Rock newspaper, daily white newspapers at the time, a lot of odd contradictory, uh, you know, evidence. Um, so Little Rock erupted and as often happened in these situations, um, kind of like the jailhouse lynchings that Karen was talking about, masses of numbers of people stormed the city jail looking for these two gentlemen. And then the state penitentiary, which was on the, you know, a little bit outside of town looking for him, them, and they weren't there. The sheriff um, and the police chief, I guess, actually had sent them out of town to a, to a jail in Texarkana to keep them, you know, safe. Um, and the piece of the story that I very sorry I did not include the other night when we did this was the leaping past the, there's another large piece of the story, but to finish the story of Frank and Lonnie Dixon, Frank's family never saw him or heard from him again and doesn't know what happened to him or where he went. Lonnie eventually, uh, um, a month and a half later, returned to Little Rock. Was returned to Little Rock for a, a capital murder trial. Um, the kind of trial that would not. Uh, it, it doesn't. By looking at it today, it's so obvious what happened there. This, um, he had court-appointed attorneys that two days before had not even talked to him or examined the case at all. Um, there was a jail. There was a jailhouse, you know, confession that was under torture, essentially. He, the 16-year-old child had been kept awake for 24 hours on his feet with no food and no water and no representation. And at the end of it all, they told him that if you don't confess, we're going to arrest your mom. You know, the, the boy is 16 years old. Um, so then he's, uh, the trial took place under a heavily, heavily guarded courthouse. And it took the jury seven minutes to convict him of murder. And a week later, I believe it was about a week later, I don't have the dates in front of me, he was he was killed in the electric chair on his 17th birthday for the murder of this little girl. And so that was a legal lynching. That was not lynching of any of the sorts that Karen was talking about, but that was so clearly a mob, uh, um, I'm sorry, what did you call it, Kwame? Uh, state sanctioned? Thanks. State sponsored yeah. terrorism. Right, that's exactly well, what that was. You described the uh, legal lynching of my great uncle. Right. <laughs> Please and continue. right, and this is Kwame's uh, grandmother's older brother. Or younger Oldest brother? brother, yes. Oldest brother, right. Um, and so then the this okay. So now we're, now we're back to the day after the discovery of the body of the little girl. Um. And the city erupted again. So, oh, this is, yeah. So the city, the city was erupting for several days. They're looking for Lonnie and Frank Dixon, the the white city now, and they are looking for a you know a, they're looking to punish somebody. And so then after a couple of this happens every night. The people are storming the jails and everything. And after a couple of days, it calms down a little bit, and the mayor and the police chief leave town um, to rest or whatever, and. Um, then that morning of May 4th, 1927, um, two women on the outskirts of town, a woman and her teenage daughter, uh, report that they've been um, confronted by a black man. And the stories vary widely as to what that entailed. He was asking for directions, their horse was bucking and he helped them, he jumped in the wagon to help them, he hit them, he knocked them out of the wagon, you know, there's a whole array of stories about what actually happened. The mother ended up with a, falling out of the wagon and getting a broken arm, uh, breaking her arm. And so then they take her in. So now, there's a, now we have an injury to a white woman that was in some manner involved a black man, which of course is the powder keg, the match to the powder keg. The Little Rock was already a powder keg here because of the little, the little white girl. And so this is the match that set the whole thing off anew. 
And so word gets back to Little Rock, and Kwame says, this is about 12 miles. I don't live in Arkansas, so this is about 12 miles out, he says, from the from yes. downtown. And we're in 1927 here, so they're not going 60 miles an hour down the interstate, you know. So anyway, so they get back, they get word back to Little Rock, and a thousand people, the sheriffs, the deputies, probably deputized citizens, everybody's, I mean, all these people, all these men are coming out and beating the woods for hours, like five hours, I believe that day, or mm -hmm. even longer, you know, all day long, they're looking for this man. And there's reports that somebody saw him and somebody saw him here and whatever. Finally, they locate someone that then they bring the daughter, the teenage daughter, they bring her out to identify him. And she says, yes, that's him. There's a lot of interesting work. Um, um, Sharice Jones Brantz at uh, Arkansas State has done some really interesting work about white women in those situations and what the factors, the, the pressures on them to give the crowd the identification that they want. Mm -hmm. So, you know, this, this, this man's name is John Carter and his guilt or innocence is, you know, impossible to determine, frankly, in this situation. It's, it, there's all kinds of, there's all kinds of a setup where he it doesn't even matter. You know, of course, in these lynchings, it doesn't even matter whether he's guilty or not to the crowd because they're out for blood and they're out for revenge to what they see as a scapegoat. And they actually said it that day. They said, we couldn't get our hands on Lonnie and Frank, so we're going to kill him instead. And so they do. They hang him from a telephone pole um, and they shoot him after he's dead. And then they take his body into town. And when they get close to town, to, to downtown, they, they, they parade with his body through downtown in a whole winding, you know, show. And they end up at the corner of Ninth and Broadway, which was in the middle of a vibrant African-American business, social, residential district. Um, Ninth Street at the time was called the, um, the Harlem of the South for the dance halls and the music and the, you know, there's a wonderful documentary done by Arkansas um, Public Television. I think it's a Arkansas Educational Television Network. Isn't that still? No, they're, they're now known as Arkansas PBS. Okay. Anyway, there's a wonderful documentary called Dreamland, all about the history of Ninth Street, which is just a wonderful thing to see if you can get, to, get hold of it. Anyway, so the corner of Ninth and Broadway in the heart of this, right next to Bethel AME Church, which is the a prominent African-American church in town, and across it, and right also on that corner is the Mosaic mm -hmm. Templars cultural, uh, the Mosaic Templars uh, headquarters at the time, which is now a, a rebuilt Mosaic Templars cultural center. They make a bonfire and they burn, they burn the body of John Carter. I thousand white people are there for hours rioting around the bonfire uh, dancing and yelling and shooting guns in the air and there's no there's no apparent law enforcement uh anywhere i mean they might be there plain clothes hiding whatever incognito everybody knows who everybody is but there's no there's no there's no show of law enforcement uh to control the crowd finally the governor who is also out of town hears about all of this and calls in the National Guard who disperses the crowd in 30 minutes. And nobody is ever, there, there was a grand jury convened um, because people were horrified. Some people were horrified by what had happened. Uh, all eyes were on Arkansas at the time because of the flood. And there was a great humanitarian need at the time because of the flood. And this was such a, you know, they were more concerned for the PR aspect, I think, because they were like, look at what people are going to see and now they're not going to help us when we need them because of the flood. Anyway, a grand jury convened and half of the jury refused to convict anyone and the other half resigned in protest and nothing ever happened after that. There was no, um, no one was ever convicted of it. And it was basically not talked about hardly at all. I mean, people knew about it, whispered about it, but there was, there was almost no public acknowledgement of this whole complicated situation series of incidents and three people were dead in the end of this um, for decades. And uh, there was a few things here and there and some, some studies about it, uh, some 
uh, attention to it. I grew up, my parents are from Little Rock, although I didn't grow up there, but I heard about this my whole life, the time they lynched a man on Ninth Street. I had heard this phrase, that phrase my whole life. And then when my grandmother, I, I had also heard separately that my great grandfather who died only a few months before I was born, that my great grandfather had been a deputy sheriff, but I never connected those two things until my grandmother, his daughter died. And in some writing of hers that I inherited, I found that they had come and gotten him, I guess the rest of the sheriffs to go look for John Carter. And he had been involved um, in the lynching. Um, involved is the extent of what I, is the extent of the word that I have. I don't know what he did that day. He was clearly not a hero. I don't know that he was actually, you know, physically one of the perpetrators, but he clearly was there. And there was not judgment about that. All I heard was they were proud, of, my family was proud of him for having been a deputy sheriff. And never did I ever hear condemnation of like, like the lynching had happened and wasn't that bad, but I never, nobody ever linked it for me. And so of course, kind of like Karen, you know, as soon as I heard this, I picked up the phone and I made all these phone calls and what are you talking about? And I can't believe, you know, that no one ever told me. Anyway, the short version of that is I ended up um, diving in, going to, going to grad school to study this and uh, interviewed people, you know, I did tons of interviews. I'm, I'm working on a book, mine's not out, mine's not written yet entirely, but I'm, um, you know, so that's my story. And it's, it's, it's connected to Kwame's in kind of, there's like, because there's two stories right there that got all kind of twisted together. And in the a really interesting thing that, uh, that happens in memory that I've learned is if you talk to somebody who has a vague memory of this now, white people in Little Rock now, and some African-American people too I met, they lynched the guy who got the little girl. Well, no, they didn't. They didn't lynch the man who murdered the little girl. I mean, legally lynched, yes, but that's not what they're talking about. In memory, the man they hung out on 12th Street Pike and that they had the riot on 9th Street, that was the man who murdered the little white girl who was found in the uh, church. But even at the time, they knew that wasn't, that wasn't true. You know, there's quotes at the time where they said, where these white men said, we couldn't get Lonnie and Frank, so we're gonna lynch this guy instead because somebody's gotta pay for what happened. And the whole question of scapegoating is a whole different, a whole different topic. Um, scapegoating some random person who had nothing to do with what actually everybody else was angry about. Yeah, and right there with that, uh, it brings up uh, mm -hmm. the uh, the discussion of accountability. When we talk about these racial terror lynchings mm -hmm. that have gone on throughout the United States in our history and those legal lynchings, uh, as you said, Karen, those jailhouse lynchings that are frankly still occurring today. Uh, one thing that is lacking from the majority of these layered stories over and over and over again is accountability, is uh, uh, acknowledgement. And I, I, I would like, I would like uh, for uh, us to talk about where do we go in getting that accountability? The, the funeral in the movie was poignant. The, the funeral in the movie, when I first saw it, uh, I could not hold back the tears that was coming down my eyes as I watched the funeral service. And I see that, yes, this is a ceremony of acknowledgement, but it's a ceremony of acknowledgement by the victims and the descendants of the victims. And that you, that's usually how it happens. But where is the overall acknowledgement and where is the overall uh, accountability for these, these people, these groups and these systems that continue to murder black people and destroy black lives? Well, Kwame, uh, you know, you're right. There, there has not been anywhere close to, uh, there certainly has not been a national acknowledgement. 
uh, we did have the uh, Senate uh, making an apology for failing to pass an anti-lynching bill some years ago. And the person who actually made sure that happened is a woman I would like to acknowledge tonight by the name of Doria Johnson. And uh, Doria Johnson was one of the first people I met when I started my quest and she had been on a quest. She's an African-American woman whose grandfather, Anthony Crawford uh, was lynched. He was a wealthy businessman. Uh, he was lynched for much the same reasons that uh, Sheila's grandfather was lynched um, in Abbeville, South Carolina. And uh, actually his memorial plaque which she managed to get before she passed away at a very young age, uh, was in that trailer that we saw before the film, Ashes to Ashes, uh, the trailer from EJI, uh, which shows a hand reaching up and touching a memorial plaque. And I noticed on that plaque, it said Anthony Crawford. And I hoped that that hand was Doria's hand. Um, and Daria was a real uh, godmother of this of this movement because she's she was at it for a long time, and she died before EJI opened. And um, but they had a big picture of her on a screen uh, for the whole opening day, and it was it was just wonderful seeing her there. Um, Accountability has been achieved by in small ways in small places. As I said, the police chief in Troop County uh, made an apology. Uh, 20 minister, white ministers made apologies. The sheriff of Harris County made an apology. Uh, there are, uh, I don't think there's been another police chief, quite frankly, to make an apology or another sheriff, but there have been mayors and city council people. This is a part of the EJI process, the reconciliation process, is to get uh, reparations. Uh, and, re and, and they recognize that reparations aren't just I'm sorry, you know, and CRRJ, which I mentioned earlier, which is holding the reparations uh, conference on Tuesday, has actually been able to get uh, in, in, in discrete places to get some reparations, some actual reparations. So in small ways, in small places, uh, there, there has been accountability, but whether we will ever have, you know, the pushes for national accountability, um, whether we'll ever get that, I think we're closer to it than we ever have been. Cory Booker's got a bill in, in um, in Congress right now uh, with Sheila Jackson and some other people. Um, so we just have to keep pushing on it, but it has to be, there has to be a groundswell. It's not just gonna come down, you know, from the goodness of, of the people at the top. Uh, there has to be a groundswell demanding it. Sheila, do you feel <laughs> that uh, there is a groundswell of accountability that has led to uh, truth about uh, uh, Mr. Gilbert's uh, murder, uh, healing from Mr. Gilbert's murder for you and your family, and a transformation uh, of the conditions that led up to this lynching uh, uh, to transform those conditions into a new state where something like this doesn't happen again. Um, so unfortunately, I would say no, <laughs> only because, and, and it's not to discount all of the things that are happening, all things Karen said are so true, so wonderful, and, and so acknowledged. However, when we talk about accountability and acknowledgement of a nation, you know, and I think it needs to start with stop doing it. So... I can hit you. <laughs> that sounds so simple, right? <laughs> so simple, right? Yeah. So I can hit you, apologize, and then hit you again. So really, have I sincerely apologized? So what does an apology and acknowledgement mean if tomorrow it happens again? And so we're talking about these stories that have gone on from slavery and then to today, from just a few months ago, if not 
happening right now. So yes, acknowledgement is awesome. Apologies are awesome. They have to happen, it needs to happen. But the overwhelming thing is that it just needs to stop. Yes, indeed. We, uh, I'm going to try throughout this conversation to bring in our audience. We still have uh, over 60 people that are watching us on the OV platform. And I wanted uh, to uh, bring in some comments. I'll just read them for everyone to know uh, what they are and anybody on the panel can respond as they so feel fit. Uh, Fred S says, this is the American history that is given short and shorter, um, sh short and shorter shift in many history books used throughout the country. Maybe a few paragraphs or a chapter at best. It doesn't go into real detail and definitely doesn't look at the generational repercussions that are caused because history is written by the victors. By not recording it, it's typically forgotten through time and just because old wives and just becomes old wives tales, which is what is wanted. To teach it brings about introspection, which can't be accepted and action which can't be tolerated if you want to maintain the status quo. What is well, this? I am uh, really, I am really watching to see who Joe Biden appoints as uh, Secretary of Education, because that is such a key uh, post for uh, dealing with these issues. Uh, to my knowledge, most of our textbooks are still concocted in Texas. Uh, and have been for a long, long time. And, um, you know, there's no democracy when it comes to school textbooks. Uh, I'm familiar with the Zen Education Project, Z-I-N-N, -N, which uh, does uh, produce wonderful curricula. So people should start at their, at their grassroots level with their, their kids' schools and say, what have you got? Because there's plenty of stuff out there uh, they, and not just in education project. That's just the one that came to mind. I'd like to say one quick thing about police though, uh, because we had a moment, we had a moment right after uh, George Floyd's murder lynching uh, where the whole world was on fire uh, demanding police reform. Um, and uh, some pretty interesting stuff got revealed and said during that time. But what mostly was revealed was the uh, power, the power of police forces to inhibit change and reform. And uh, that's gonna be a problem. That's gonna be, it, it is a problem uh, through their unions and, and through the conservative right, um, there is no uh, there is no desire for anything approaching police reform. One of the things uh, Sheila and I have both taken part in uh, conferences that included police officers and police chiefs uh, uh, who have some uh, at, uh, about a dozen uh, police departments in Georgia have made a commitment. Uh, to study their history and to deal with racism in their departments. Now, 10, that's 10 out of what, seven, 18,000. Uh, I mean, there are huge numbers of police departments and they're all separate. There's no overall, you know, the, Depart the Department of Justice can do some things, but not a whole lot. So we are up against, uh, you know, a, 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 big, a big wall that does not want to look at these things. And this is something I think, you know, the, the momentum is still there. People are still, you know, Black Lives Matter is still attending to this. Um, I think, you know, I think it's unfortunate. Um, there will be people who disagree with me, but I think it's unfortunate that the term defund the police got used because I think that put people in a bind that, I mean, it was misunderstood. Mm -hmm. um, you know, it was meant, it, nobody wants to get rid of police entirely. They just want a whole different sort of uh, 
animal out there, uh, you know, doing different things uh, with a different mindset. Um, well, so even, think, even bringing up police, that brings up uh, the conversation when you even talk about defunding the police, the uh, mental health aspect that goes into uh, a lot of these uh, present day lynchings. And with that, I wanted to bring in a comment by one of our anonymous uh, viewers. Uh, and this comment says, I am a healthcare provider. I wish the healthcare community could acknowledge that the trauma and abuse that, African Amer that the African American community has experienced both in and out of the healthcare system from the white community influences how they are now able or not able to participate in healthcare. And one, one, of the, one, of the, one of the things in the movie that was a recurring uh, theme was uh, Mr. Uh, Rim, Rimhart's uh, health as he dealt with this trauma that he could not release. Uh, how, how does that play into uh, what we're talking about, uh, Stephanie? Well, I'm not, I have no medical knowledge personally myself, but yeah, I agree. I mean, there's the generational, well, there's the actual, the trauma, I mean, PTSD and the health, you know, the related health impacts on him clearly. Um, and right, I mean, there's all kinds, I mean, ACEs and there's all kinds of stuff uh, you know, that are now, that the, the, health, the, the healthcare medical community is paying attention to, you know, early trauma and how that leads to health problems down the road, you know, similar to the kinds of things, you know, heart problems, diabetes, all sorts of things. Um, and there's also a lot of, um, you know, the intergenerational trauma. Um, and I, I don't have enough knowledge about that to speak well, uh, to speak enough about it, but I know you know, there's, all, there's inter really interesting research and evidence of intergenerational trauma, health results of inter intergenerational trauma like that. Well, Sheila, uh, intergenerational trauma, uh, you seem like you might know something about that. Right. Yeah, so I also wanted to just speak a little bit about the healthcare because I have been in the health field for uh, quite a few years. And so that was one thing that really stood out to me um, when Mr. Renford talked about, you know, the diabetes and the high blood pressure, and it really just brought a tie in that um, when you're dealing with trauma, when you're dealing with stress, all of that manifests itself through diseases and, and conditions. And so that makes a lot of sense. Also, when you suppress a people and put them in neighborhoods where there's not healthy food, there's not healthy um, um, air, different things like that, it continues to, to be an issue. So right now we're in a state of COVID, right? And so they keep saying that brown and black people are the ones that are being affected. And these are some of the reasons why is because of the healthcare. Also, it's, it's also been known that within our communities, we're being as African-Americans or people of color we are often dismissed oh, it's in your head, it's not really, you know, happening. They even, there's statistics that, you know, so many women of um, African descent, their babies die. They don't make it through, um, through the birthing process. And I have a college student living with me today. She's 23 years old. She mentioned that she doesn't want to have kids because so many African-American women die in childbirth. And that broke my heart that that is her thought process of not having children. So when you talk about um, intergenerational, was it intergenerational trauma you asked me about? Yes, yes. Yeah, so um, one thing I didn't mention is that I did not know about my grandfather until about three years ago. So if you had asked me three years ago if I had trauma, I would say no, right, from what? Now, today, I have clear trauma. In fact, by watching um, Ashes to Ashes, and this is my third time watching it, when it came to the part of him, of them wanting to lynch him, I, I, I walked up and got out the room. 
and then I came back because it's such a challenge to watch. And before these things were not a challenge to watch, but also I look at my mother. Again, this was my grandfather that was lynched. This was my mother's father that raised my mother. My mother is still alive today. She's 93 years old. And now that I know her journey, I can look back and see the trauma. Things that I kind of dismissed or why is she this way? That's all trauma. There's an amazing documentary that was just um, finished by CRRJ about my grandfather. My mother said she did not want to watch it. So I'm there, she changes her mind. The first screen comes up and it says the lynching of Henry Peg Gilbert. And that was all she couldn't watch anymore. The word lynching brought on trauma. And then let me talk a little bit real quick about my mom because I want to bring Karen in on this because Karen has been such a healing process for my mother. And Karen um, actually wrote my mom a letter, which I, I thought was great, but, but did not at the time realize how much of a healing process that was. So when we talk about taking accountability and acknowledgement, I want to recognize Karen in that she did it. She stepped up, you know, and she always says she had to, but in my mind, she didn't necessarily have to. She could have continued to live her life and be fancy free and move on and, and go on. But she, she made a stance to stand up and say no. And not only did she stand up, she wrote my mother a letter, which really aided in her healing. And unfortunately, they, they communicate via mail. Unfortunately, they're not able to talk on the phone. They're not able to meet in person. Karen tried it. And that's when I saw true trauma. Karen was coming to visit my mother. My mother did not know Karen was coming. I let her know. And seriously, at that time, my mother reverted back to that 19-year-old who found out her father was murdered, mm. was lynched. And she went into a fetal position in a chair, stood up, screamed, and nothing came out. She sat down and she said, my mother wiped my eyes 70 years ago and we never looked back again. And then she laid down for an hour, which I'm freaking out because my 90 year old mother is laying down because of trauma. And when she got up and she arose from that bed, it was as if nothing had happened. Mm. Because that's how African-Americans dealt with that pain yeah. and that trauma. You, you, you buried it and you moved on. And she said, I really hope that Karen does not think that I don't like her or that I'm mad at her. It's not that, it's what she represents. But my mother has also called Karen an angel in that because she has reached out and um and apologized so so karen karen you're uh reaching out to her mother sounds like it was a double-edged sword what do you think well you know i'd first like to say you know in, in terms of what sheila just said you know it's it's been a two-way street in terms of healing uh because i've had to heal too and, uh, you know, so the, the, the love and generosity and acceptance that has been shown to me by Sheila and her family, her whole big, wide, beautiful family, uh, including her mother, um, you, you know, has, has just been amazing. And, uh, you know, so it, it, it works, it, it works in, in, in crazy ways and I'll be long dead before I ever understand what <laughs> what's going on here. I, I just kind of do what I feel like I'm almost programmed to do. But, you know, I also would like to throw in, and I don't want to belabor this because the issue really is the trauma done to African-American people, but people did not do what they did. They did not hang people from trees. They did not batter them to pulp without having some impact on their psyches. And those impacts got passed down. And I was raised by a woman whose father allowed this to happen. 
And my mother, I was six years old, so my mother was, what, 32 years old when this happened. She knew about it. She knew her beloved father, the only thing in her life that she was really proud of was this sheriff father was responsible for this. She would never have let herself admit it. But so every time I showed an inclination as a child to be kind or interested in or loving toward black people, I would get smacked down. All my genuinely human instincts were considered dangerous because we could not, we could not feel for black people because then we would have to start knowing what we had done and dealing with that. And so I found myself in 1986, the grandmother of an African-American, a, a mixed race, race baby. And I could not tell my family about this child because I was having nightmares that were so serious. I was afraid something awful was going to happen to her, which was crazy. It was crazy. I mean, it was irrational, but that's epigenetic trauma. And that's what sent me down to Georgia to find out what had happened. And when I did find out that that lynching in 1912 was about the killing, the murder of our own kinfolk because the youngest man on the tree that night, that midnight beside that baptismal font at Friendship Baptist Church in Hamilton, Georgia was a member of my family, mm. a cousin mm. from slavery. And it is also rumored and I will never know that the woman who was lynched was pregnant with one of my great uncle's children. So I, I was carrying a history of a family that killed its black children. And I didn't know that. I didn't know why I was so terrified for this child until I discovered why this lynching took place. So white people, you know, who think that that they just got all the goodies from this. And one thing I'll say, there was never another open air lynching in Harris County, Georgia after that. And the reason there wasn't is because, this is what every white person I interviewed who was still alive at the time said to me, every man in the mob died with his boots on. So I researched that, I didn't, because everybody said it and I didn't believe it. I said, that couldn't be. That, what they meant was they killed each other. They killed each other off. And I, in fact, was able to find evidence that 15 of them had been murdered by others of them. Now, I don't, you know, we, we'll never know whether it was about that, whether, you know, certainly African-Americans saw it and white people saw it as rough justice. They said nobody was ever, you know, everybody knew that those four people were innocent. Every white person I interviewed said it was a terrible thing that happened. Those four people were innocent. They found out later who did it, a white man, of course. Uh, there had been a murder of the sheriff's nephew. So, um, they knew he was innocent, but they, then they would say to me, but every man in the mob died with his boots on, which was their way of saying, you know, God had his way. They paid. So they saw that as a kind of accountability. Wow. Uh, and in this process, another thing that uh, we need to address is uh, the silence. The silence is so deafening uh, in the chat. There's so much good discussion going on in the chat right now. So I definitely will be downloading the chat and sending it to anybody who wants a copy of the chat. Uh, you definitely can uh, send me an email at APJMM. Let me see, look behind me, APJMM. Uh, 2019 at gmail.com if you'd like a copy of the chat and a copy of the video 
uh, from this uh, discussion. But uh, there are several comments and I, I, I don't even know where to go right now uh, because Sheila, there's some comments dealing with health that I wanna ask you, but there, there's, there's a comment that was made two or three times about the inability to even uh, verbalize uh, Black Lives Mattering, the inability to even verbalize uh, uh, the necessity, the absolute necessity of uh, defunding the police. And Karen, you, you even talked about uh, the white community and uh, 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 people uh, who are made label themselves as conservative hijacking that term where it is now totally mis uh, misconstrued, misunderstood. And so I wanna talk about the silence. I wanna show you guys uh, this binder right here. I don't, can you see this binder? You see how thick it is? Mm -hmm. This binder. Oh, wow. This is the binder that uh, Stephanie, this is all of her research that she uh, gave to my mother uh, because of the silence that here in uh, this country, here in this state of Arkansas, here in this city of Little Rock, the silence surrounding uh, my family's uh, victimization in this process, uh, my mom, and my aunts, until Stephanie came into their lives, they never publicly spoke about what happened to Lonnie Dixon, their uncle. I didn't learn about what happened to Lonnie Dixon myself until I was a senior in high school. And what I used to do is I used to, I, I'm, a, I'm a, a bookworm. So I literally used to spend my Saturday afternoons uh, at the Central Arkansas Library main branch, uh, just researching and looking through things. Uh, and the reference librarian was like my best friend. And one day I'm sitting there, uh, you know how you have the microfilms and you put it in the machine and you turn it around and everything. I was reading the microfilms and I came across a news article about uh, Lonnie Dixon. And that's how I learned about it. And I immediately left the library. Uh, and I left the library because I didn't really know who Lonnie Dixon was, but I saw the name Frank Dixon. And I knew that my great grandfather's name was Frank Dixon. And so I immediately left the library and went and got on uh, the, uh, the city bus and rode the bus over to my grandmother's house. Uh, which was uh, oh. about five, 10 minutes away. And I asked my grandmother, I'm like, um, I just learned, I just read something about Frank Dixon. And in the article, they mentioned somebody named Lonnie Dixon. Who is Lonnie Dixon? And oh I saw, and <laughs> not too much color can go out of my grandmother because my grandmother is such a light skinned, uh, a melanated woman that she actually passed for white uh, and became a part of the uh, white uh, uh, women who helped uh, to desegregate Little Rock Central High School in 1957. But uh, I saw the color, the little bit of color that's left in my mo grandmother leave her and she turned completely like I, I, I know now that that was the trauma that just hit her. And the fact that her beloved grandson just brought up something that she never mentioned herself to me really took her back. And she had to take me into the kitchen and sit me down and you know make a pot of grits and have a conversation with me. Uh, but the thing here is that there's still a silence. There's still a uh, a willfulness to not speak about these stories that have happened. And we can't, we can't do anything until we do 
what Karen did for Sheila or what Stephanie did for my mother and for my aunts. And I just want to thank you, Stephanie, for what you did for my mother, uh, because I told my mother uh, that I was going to be spending the afternoon with you today. And she told me, tell Stephanie, I said hello and tell her that I love her. Oh, say back to her. I, yeah. It was lovely and, meeting her and your Aunt Clay. And yes. again, Karen, I thank you for what you did for Sheila's mother. Uh, just well, as Sheila just thanked you as well. Thank, so. thank you to everyone. You know, I can remember when Stephanie first started this project and she was terrified uh, of her mother. Uh, yeah. I think. Yeah. 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 Just as I had been terrified right. of my right. mother. Right. So I can't, you know, most of my work is talking people through their mother fear, even when the mothers <laughs> have been gone forever. They, they, you know, those mothers put duct tape over our mouths. Mm. And, uh, you know, old women like me are still holding their tongue. You know, because mama would just, this would just kill mama, even though mama has long been dead. And you know, when my mother found out what I was doing, she called her mother, because her mother was the first person to tell, to, to let me know what had happened, her mother. And uh, she called her mother a liar to me. She said, you know, you know, you can't believe what she says. Um, but as time went on and she saw that I was not going to put this thing down and she never asked me to, she said, I'll have to leave town, but she did not ask me not to do it. And she began to slip tidbits of information. And the biggest tidbit of information I got, which really broke the whole story open for me she said, you know, in Harris County, there were a lot of two family families. Mm. And I said, what is that? And she said, well, a white man would have a white family and a black family. And they all live sort of in the same area and they all knew about each other and everybody knew about them. And I have, I have been keeping a list. I've got a list of about 102 family families from Harris County, Georgia now. Uh, and this is what that lynching was all about. It was embarrassing that, you know, the, you know, the South was trying to get back into the good graces of the, of the country and they were being called hypocrites because of the, you know, the way things were in the South. Uh, and a lot of it was about rape, but some of it wasn't. Some of it was people living in sort of families. So uh, my mother gave me that and I will ever be grateful because I would not really have been able to figure out what that lynching was all about uh, without that information. So Thank um, you. When you mentioned um, trauma, three things, I mean, when you mentioned silence, three, three, three things popped in my head, which is trauma, fear, mm -hmm. and then just not being heard or changing the narrative. So a lot of our history is lost because of the trauma behind it. So if something traumatizing happens to you, you don't want to talk about it. Similar to in the, the movie where, or the film where, you know, Mr. Rembert was saying every time he draws, it, it brings that memory. He can't mm -hmm. sleep. So, so that's why things aren't talked about in our community. And then the fear. So my understanding is when my grandfather was murdered, and I'm sure this has happened with all of the murders, that they were, family members were threatened, the community was threatened, neighbors were threatened. If you talk about this, we will kill you. Right. You are never to talk about this ever again. My mother also talked about how many people lied. And she said, even people that were close to us, family members lied. And she's like, I understood because the police went to them and said, if you don't lie, we're gonna kill you. And she said, it still hurt, but she understood. Because not only will we kill you, we're gonna kill your whole family. So that's another reason that um, we've lost our history. And, 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 and that's terrorism right there. That's terrorism, which again, brings on trauma. <laughs> so, yeah. And then just not being heard. And the reason why I, I, I thought about that and changing the narrative is like 
Black Lives Matter came out just to say, let's acknowledge that Black Lives Matter. And then how was the narrative changed? Well, all lives matter. Why are you saying that? All lives matter. Colin Kaepernick goes on one knee to protest that you know Black people are being killed in, in America, but the narrative was changed that Black people don't love America. And now he loses his job and, and blackballed from it all. So, so there's this consistent narrative that has always changed. And it also made me think about, um, I got uh, two, two different newspapers about the killing of my grandfather. And one was the newspaper that was written up in majority of the papers, but also in the African-American paper that you know mentioned that he was killed and, and what happened. But then there was also a newspaper that pre predominantly white people read. And it said how Victoria's sheriff kills um, criminal who attacked him in the jail to the point when you read it and you don't know the real story, you would say, wow, that, that sheriff was great. You know, he did a, you know, he, he protected his life and that horrible criminal, you know, hurt him. And so it also makes me think, you know, um, about some of the news things that we're getting today. You can watch one station and you get one narrative and you can watch a, a totally different station and get a totally different narrative. And so the narrative is consistently being changed to fit what, the, what they want or what the story, what the story, the, what they want the story to be. <laughs> and Sheila, you just brought up something that's really powerful. Myself uh, being a uh, historian uh, in my, in my spare time uh, and doing a lot of the research, we have to definitely uh, pay reverence to uh, such institutions as the, the Chicago Defender yeah. and other black papers that were able to tell the truth uh, right. so that when <clears throat> the white papers were right, as you said, Sheila, uh, we just, well, we'll wait to hear what the Chicago Fender has to say. Right. And then you get these two side-by-side -side narratives. And with you saying that, I need to ask you a question, Stephanie. Can you talk about uh, the involvement of, um, the? I'm trying to pronounce this guy's name correctly. Uh, uh, is it Marset Hottaman Julius? Oh, yes. And, uh, the way that his his empire of telling stories helped to tell a narrative that wasn't told in the white papers. Yes, absolutely. So that actually is a woman, Marset Haldeman Julius. Okay. Um, her husband was Emmanuel, um, and together they ran the um, Little Blue Book uh, Empire. Um, I I can't recall offhand what the name of their whole company was. But they had a the Haldeman Julius, I think, was the name of the, of the of the enterprise. But they would publish these little blue books, and there's I have I have the one here somewhere. Anyway, they're seriously little. They were like you know four by six, you know, like the size of a large index card, and they would be on topics. I mean, there were thousands of these at the time. You know, how to clean your curtains and Marxism and food and you know just a, a, an unbelievable array of topics and they and Marcet Haldeman Julius was a reporter and writer and they wrote they wrote they wrote these together and they also published a magazine called the the Haldeman Julius Monthly and Marcet happened to be in Little Rock like the day after the lynching happened the, the Don Carter lynching and being a writer and a reporter she's on the ground here and there's this major thing has just happened so of course she kicks into gear and she interviews everybody. She finds I mean, like everybody. And she puts together this little blue book, which first she publishes it serially in the, in the uh, Haldeman Julius Monthly, I think in September of that year of 1927. And then, she, and then they published the little blue book. And um, it's called The Story of a Lynching. And it's a, I don't know, I can't remember, 35, 40, little, 40 page little booklet. And yeah, it's really interesting because she has an awful lot of details in there um, that didn't make it into the, well, they were two separate papers at the time, the Arkansas Democrat and the Arkansas Gazette were the morning and the evening white papers in Little Rock. Well, reverse, the Gazette was the morning. Anyway, um, and so she has all kinds of details and all kinds of people she talked to that tell, you know, a, a slightly, a, you know, a, 
a different angle, quite a different angle on the story because she so clearly saw, she saw what was happening. Um, she and her husband were, um, were quite left, uh, quite, quite left from their, their perspective. Um, and I don't want to label them because I don't know properly how to, how to label them, but their, their, their views were, were quite from far to the left perspective on what was happening. And so she was looking um, at, she was looking at the white power structure and, and digging holes in the pieces of the story, frankly. And she ended up contacting Walter White at the NAACP to ask for his help defending, because she saw what was going to happen to Lonnie Dixon. And she ended up contacting the NAACP for their legal help in defending Lonnie, which they did not end up doing because it was, what was going to happen to him was such a foregone conclusion, um, given the atmosphere at the time. Um, I, Walter White, I believe, ended up, I can't remember this offhand, but I believe he ended up coming to Little Rock and doing a little bit of his own research. And he was somebody who could pass as well because he was quite light-skinned himself. And that was part of how he was able to get access to all kinds of stuff um, that white people wouldn't normally talk to black people about at the time. Um, but anyway, this this little, it's, it's just quite, it's, you know, she interviewed the women, the, the family of the women who were in the wagon. Um, she interviewed, um, she interviewed white people. I don't believe, I don't recall her interviewing a lot of African-American people, but she still, even just interviewing white people, she was able to find like odd little pieces that were holes in the story. Um, yeah, I mean, I guess that's, I guess that's, a. um, and they, oh, 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 one more thing. So then they wrote a, she wrote a book a few years later, she wrote a novel called Violence, a story of love and race in the deep south i might not have that that subtitle correct but it, but it's available i mean you might be able to find one of those print on demand kind of versions of it anyway it's called violence and haldeman julius hyphenated is the is the surname of the author and it's basically a fictionalized telling of this entire story of wow yeah <laughs> of John Carter and Lonnie Dixon and Fluella McDonald i mean all of this it's it's a fictionalized um it's a novel, you know. I mean, even I, I, I read it after I had done all this deep research, and still, I mean, it's an interesting novel to read, even though I knew it was going to happen, right? But what she's done in that, and there were some rumors about it, Kwame, your your mother had told me too, even in the family, there was rumors about whether Lonnie was, Lonnie and the little girl, I mean, the, the first reports of the little girl were that she was 11. By the time a month or a month and a half had gone by, she suddenly becomes 13 in some of the reports. So, okay. And then Lonnie was reported anywhere between 15 and 18. And so if you take an 11 year old and a 19 year old, there's not really going to be any connection there. But if you take somebody who's 13 and somebody who's 15, and maybe the 15 year old boy is like very light skinned enough to pass like his sister, you know, there were possibilities of, of some kind of relationship between the two of them. And so that was some, that yeah, was a that's rumor. Yeah, that's the story that uh, I learned that uh, there was a uh, sexual relationship between the two. Right. Well, and that and she uses that in uh, in the book, in the novel, which also brings out like, you know, Lillian Smith's Strange Fruit. You know, it's a very similar story, except that this was written. I can't remember when she wrote that. I believe 1929. So this predates Strange Fruit by what, 15 years or so. So, wow. It's a, yeah, it's very interesting. All right, let's. Uh, we got a couple of other things in the chat. There, you you guys uh, that are viewing, you guys are just blowing up the chat, and I'm loving it. Uh, let me get to. There was a question for Sheila that I really want to get to. Here's a question for uh, Karen that I want to get to here. Hold, but hold on a second. Um, All right, there's so much. I can, Okay, so what I'm going to have to do is I'm just going to have to pair. Oh, here it is. Um, I disagree with the healthcare community that the healthcare community is paying attention to research around trauma, ACEs, and the Black community. And then another person came right after that and said there's also an issue of trust in a largely dominant, uh, white dominant healthcare system. How does this white healthcare system 
and the lack of trust that Black people have with this healthcare system tie into us being able to uh, overcome uh, this uh, tr uh, trauma that is clearly killing us, uh, Sheila. What What do you think about that? So that's true. There is a lack of trust amongst African Americans in the healthcare system, and I think a lot of it is stems behind the way we've been treated in the healthcare system. I mean, of course, Tuskegee, Tuskegee experiment pops up right away, right? And, and there's other instances. And so people don't trust it. And so um, I'm, in, I'm in the sales part of it. And so I remember um, quite a few years ago, one of the doctors talking to me about how and why do African-Americans not want to get vaccinated? And of course I had to share with him some of our history so that he can fully understand the rationale behind it. But then also, um, I, I think as African-Americans, we're not taken seriously. Um, we're not always offered some of the, the latest and greatest technology. Um, and those are some of the things that, that I've kind of committed myself to do within the company that I'm working for now, because I've switched over from pharma to medical devices. And, and we are really trying to tackle uh, disparities in healthcare and going out and doing a little bit more education. But I also think they need to see more of us. And that's where these companies don't really get it. You know, so you can send a bunch of white people out there and, and their hearts can be in the right place. And, and I know in many cases they, they are. Um, but if, if the community does not see us, then that makes it an, an issue. And those are some of the things that, that we're, we're trying to, to tackle. So it's difficult. It's difficult because um, sitting in meetings and, and hearing that we're number one in diabetes, we're number one in high blood pressure, we're number one in, in, in every single category, you know, and, and it, it breaks my heart. But I also think that education and learning, watching things like, like Ashes to Ashes, and different things like that, and really tying it together, really educating our, ourselves to understand the systemic um, issues that are there that cause this. So it's not that we're just walking around sick or anything like that. There are things that have, have really impacted us as a people out of our control that has caused all of this. And also us educating ourselves you know, around it. So I can say that, and I mentioned this, you know, on Friday that I was one that I personally feel like I, I walked around with my head in the sand, you know, and then um, learning about my grandfather really has, has awakened me. And I do feel like the nation has somewhat awakened because of, of the, the lynching of George Floyd, unfortunately, that it took that to, to wake us up. But sometimes it takes traumatic things to wake us up. To, to really dig in and start educating ourselves to make a change. Uh, you brought a, you mentioned the Tuskegee syphilis experiment. I'm gonna give you guys an interesting historical fact. The Tuskegee syphilis experience actually started in Arkansas, in Hot Springs, Arkansas. Really? Uh, in, uh, in Hot Springs, Arkansas, they, were act, they actually started it on uh, poor white people in Hot Springs and Booker T. Washington was in Hot Springs uh, having a meeting uh, with uh, uh, the founder of Sears Roebuck. And that's when uh, he learned about uh, what was going on in this experiment. And he said, he, he actually spoke to uh, the founder of Sears Roebuck and got him to fund uh, a similar experiment uh, at Tuskegee Institute, uh, where they could do this pretty much the same thing on uh, black men. Mm. Uh, so uh, I, I thought that that was very interesting. I, I learned so much about how my home state of Arkansas is really tied into a lot of interesting historical facts. So yeah. I just wanted to bring that up. Uh, we are coming to the end. Uh, we promised everybody that we uh, go until five o'clock and it's about three minutes to five. I, just, I could keep talking about this all night, but what I wanna do 
is I want to give everybody an opportunity to make some closing statements. Uh, I'm, I'm going to pull up a couple more comments uh, for us. Yeah, let me pull up these a couple more comments first. And then we're going to go ahead and close it out. And anybody who's interested in uh, getting a copy of the chat and a copy of the video uh, from this discussion, all you have to do is uh, inbox me, uh, send me an email, and we'll send it to you. Anne says, I am a Euro American woman, spent 25 years as a family nurse practitioner in the Bronx. Southwest Yonkers, Harlem, and Washington Heights. Uh, reading a, a medical apartheid, I learned so much horrifying history that I know now must have been part of the baggage some of my patients must have been carrying. There is so much we white folks don't understand about the real history of our relationships with black or African-American folks trying to learn more. I also try to feel that that must, somebody just put a comment in here. Let me get back to where, what I was reading. Hold on a second. All right, here we go. I also try to feel what that, I also try to feel what that must be like. I know I never can, but I do have Somebody else put a comment in, let me go back. <laughs> That's one thing I hate about the comments in OV is when somebody puts in a new comment, it shifts everything. So you have to keep going back. So here we go. I will never know, I, ne I know I never can, but I do have some close black friends with whom I can talk honestly about our lives and we have become much closer. Zooming now in our separation, for which I am grateful. We are all learning so much. So the, 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 the question that I have for the panel, uh, particularly you, Stephanie, and you, uh, Karen, uh, how is it that uh, you are able as uh, w uh, white women to uh, keep this going and to uh, actually be a true ally, not an ally in words, but an ally in actions. Uh, how are you able to continue to do that? Uh, well, what I do is, uh, from the what, what I do, Kwame, is uh, I try to work with people like me who are not, who have not found their place yet, but are wanting to. I don't spend a lot of time arguing with stone cold racists, but there are a lot of white folks out there that just kind of are on the cusp of coming out and being allies. So I'm working with, with several organizations right now as a kind of uh, advisor on anti-racism programs, uh, running, running trainings and study groups and uh, going for, we're right now, I live on Capitol Hill in DC and I'm working with several groups that are beginning to try to target uh, different systems. Uh, and healthcare is definitely one of them, especially healthcare for elderly uh, people of color. Um, what, one of the things that I'm beginning to realize is that in my own, uh, I use Kaiser Permanente as my HMO. Uh, and I've always seen Kaiser as a kind of anti-racist organization because there are a lot of people of color, both on staff and as patients. But I don't really know that, you know, and I just want to start asking questions uh, of people, you know, that, of people of color. What, what kind of care do they feel that they're getting from Kaiser? I have no reason to believe it's not good. But I think that... Uh, we're in such a crucial situation in this country right now, especially with COVID, but even before, that uh, African-American healthcare needs a Marshall Plan. I mean, we need to be uh, creating programs that completely retrain doctors and especially train new African-American healthcare workers from doctors on, all across the board. Uh, it needs to be taken seriously. And if it's ever going to be taken seriously, I can't imagine that there's going to be a better time to do that. 
Um, I'll, I'll use Karen as my model here, uh, but... Um, Do better. <laughs> well, where, my, my circumstance is right at the moment. I mean, I'm working in my, you know, my own sphere of influence is much smaller than Karen's right at the moment. Um, and I think we're in a, a, a point in this country. I mean, the, the protests this summer to me looked different because of how sustained they were and how many young people and how many white people there were in these protests. And I think until, you know, to me, it looks different now. I mean, maybe, I mean, I hope it's sustained. Obviously we all want it to be sustained and for this to bring actual real systemic change. Um, I, uh, it, it just, it looked, I don't know how, I mean, I would love to hear Sheila and, and Kwame what you thought about that, but I, to me, it looked different. There's a different sort of energy to it. Um, I think that, I mean, the, the, the things that I can do at the moment are, are pushing back in, in, within my, you know, my small circle right at the moment here, you know, like I, one thing that struck me when Karen was talking a while back was, you know, we heard a lot of, we've heard so much recently about police brutality, obviously, and police lynching um, African Americans and Nobody can say, I mean, Karen and I are witness to, nobody can say this is a recent problem. I mean, obviously the African-American community has known this a recent problem forever. I mean, I mean, has known it's been a problem forever, but I think there's, there's been, I've been in conversations with white people who say, oh yeah, we're, you know, there's so much recent police brutality. And I said, wait a minute, wait a minute. My great grandfather was a deputy sheriff in 1927. That's not recent. You know, Karen's great grandfather and grandfather were sheriffs and deputies, what, 1912, you know? That's not recent. This is not a new thing. And I think, you know, where I stand, having done so much history research and, and as a writer, you know, pushing back in those ways, you know, that tells people, making, talking to white people is what white people need to do. You know, black people know what's going on with all this. And it's about time. It's way past time for white people to be the ones talking to white people and say, look, you know, this is white history. This is not just black history. This is not even not even taking American history as a broad thing. If you this is what what white people have been doing. This is white history. history. White people in America, huh? Right. Well, the, I'm sorry. The history of white people in America. Right. You can't you can't tell the history of white people in you know I went I I lived in Charlottesville for um, some years ago. You can't tell the story of Thomas Jefferson with all the great things that he did without saying. And he had signed all these people and Sally Hemings and, 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 you know, that's, it's another part of the story. And it's, the story's not complete unless you tell the rest of, remember, what was his name on the radio? And that's the rest of the story. You know, we have to tell the rest of the story. And I think when white people speak up, it maybe gives other white people a framework to also speak up and to pay attention to their own lives. And I mean, that's been my hope from when I started working on this research myself is that, you know, there are thousands, if not millions of white people who have family roots in the South and other parts of the country who have these kind of stories in their history. And, you know, the more of us who speak up, then the more who speak up and the more acknowledgement there is. And acknowledgement to me is one of the first steps that has to happen. Sheila, well, the, one of the, the things two. that Dr. Whitaker said in the film is <clears throat> uh, she basically spoke to what Stephanie just talked about. And uh, she basically said that uh, you need to, white person, you need to sit with your discomfort and you need to sit with your agony of the truth uh, because that is not in any way in comparison to the pain and agony and torture that the victims of these lynchings experienced as well as what their families experienced then and are continue to experience now. Uh, I, th I, think, I think you uh, knew exactly what she was talking about when she said that work, didn't you? Yeah. Well, you know, I think that uh, I tell I tell people the two organizations you need to join are uh, coming to the table and uh, surge standing up for racial justice 
And I'm sure there are others that these are just the ones that I'm familiar with and I have great respect for uh, because uh, it's hard to do this on your own. Uh, and a lot of white people feel like they are only around other white people that uh, they have to argue with all the time. And so you need allies yourself. You need people uh, that will tell you the truth and, and tell it to you uh, straight, uh, but who are going through the same thing you're going through. I mean, it's kind of like, I, I, I think of it as like 12 step groups. You know, we've got a disease. We've got, we've got the disease of racism. We've got the disease of white, of white supremacy. And we aren't able to see it until we are, uh, you know, around other people. Now, you know, I personally prefer to talk to black people. Uh, you know, I just do. Uh, but that's easy. You know, it, the hard thing is talking to white people. Uh, I really have to control myself. I really have to hold my tongue. I really have to be honest and say, you know, whatever anger and, and dissatisfaction I'm feeling with you is just a projection of that which I feel toward myself. Uh, because we, we have been brought up in a very pathological way. Even those of us that think we're healthy just because of how we see the world. And we are living in a society that is crumbling under our very feet because of racism. And we've still got white people that feel like they have a choice as to whether to be allies or not. I don't even like the term allies. I mean, honest to God, if you, if, if you as a white person can't see how racism is destroying our country and you know your own future and certainly your children and grandchildren's future then you know i don't know what to say to you because well, we're you know, you know, at this point no, at this no. point we're all in this yeah with you saying that, i wrote an article this morning for our newsletter uh that uh, i'm going to be sending out to everybody that signed up uh, to both today's and uh, Friday's uh, event here. But in that article, I talked about the importance of uh, white America. Uh, you know, you guys need to stop being hypocrites. And right now, white America, everybody's talking about uh, uh, President Donald Trump and his refusal to concede and give a concession speech uh, to uh, Joe Biden. And you know, my thing, the thing in the article I talked about, well, every single white American, they need to give their own concession speech. They need to give up their uh, attachments to white supremacy and concede. And once they, everybody gives their concession speech, then we can move forward because a concession speech not only acknowledges uh, what has happened, uh, but it also gives a plan for moving forward together because to concede means to yield with. And with that, I would like to go ahead and bring this to an end and give everybody an opportunity to say some last words. Stephanie, I would like you to go first and then when you get finished, Karen and Sheila will end with you. Um, I don't know what else I have to say. <laughs> uh, thank you. Say goodbye. <laughs> yeah, I'll just say thank you and goodbye. And uh, <laughs> I, I, I so appreciate working with Kwame and with his mother and with his aunt. It's, it's well, lovely. Well, Stephanie, uh, definitely, uh, you had planned to be in Little Rock uh, this past May for right. uh, the uh, John Carter memorialization that we were uh, had planned to do, but COVID changed that. Right. But uh, when you do come back to Little Rock, we're going to sit down and uh, you and I are going to work on getting that book completed. <laughs> and then oh. we're going to get that book optioned and turn it into a motion picture. Oh, boy. <laughs> Maybe you want to read it first. <laughs> <laughs> well, I have all the information I need right, right. here. 
Oh, it's that. a great story. I mean, it's a really fascinating story, you know, besides my own connection to it. I mean, just at, reading, reading this story as a writer, it's a really fascinating story. You know? Well, as soon as we get off of here, I'm going to go look for victim and purchase that. And violence, violence. Violence, violence. I'm going to get that and read it. Yeah. I, I'll, let me email you the, some information about it. Yeah. Okay, indeed. And it's great to meet you, Sheila, and great to see you again, Karen. Good to see you too, Stephanie. And I think I've said enough, so I'm just going to say uh, thank you to everyone and uh, those of you out there. Uh, just keep keep working for peace and justice. Good night. And Sheila Moss Brown. Go yes. Ahead. Go ahead and put a period on the end of this paragraph. <laughs> Well, real quick, if I could just have a, just a couple minutes. So, you know, um, I just want to comment on, you know, Stephanie had mentioned about white people talking to white people. And I remember being at an event and it was a mixed crowd and Karen stood up and she pointed her finger at all of the white people. And she's like, all you white people need to find um, whatever your people did to black people, acknowledge it, and then find those black people and apologize. So, I mean, she had the courage and the boldness to stand up and and I remember I'm my still family. waiting to hear from them. <laughs> <laughs> my family just like, oh my God, that is that was just awesome that she did that. But yes, Stephanie, white people do need to talk to white people because I think that is going to make a huge difference. But I think it also needs to be white people like you and Karen who are highly educated on African American history to talk to white people because I've been in situations where white people are talking to each other without the knowledge and getting it completely wrong. And I'm like, that's not even right. So, yeah. you know, I, I implore, um, I, I just think white people really should at least have an African-American, it doesn't have to be a friend, but an ally, someone that they can bounce things off of and talk to and, and kind of get, you know, a, 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 a knowledge behind that. And then we talk about uncomfortableness. I didn't get a chance to respond on that, but you're right. You know, please, please respond right now. <laughs> yeah, we have been so uncomfortable all our lives. And of course, the, you know, of course, lynching, how, how uncomfortable is that? But even just from a day to day, when we're pulled over by the police, how uncomfortable is that? Or when we're the only black person in a meeting and, you know, we're trying to fit in or we're followed in a store, you know, like we can name so many day to day things that make us uncomfortable. So for white people to be uncomfortable with a conversation, when we deal with this on an everyday basis is a little insulting, you know? I heard like, a story about a guy that was uncomfortable while he was bird watching. Right. Oh yeah, absolutely, absolutely. And then, you know, trauma is real. Vote, 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 vote. I'm so proud of this election where people really stood up and, and, and not only did we vote, now we need to, to hold people accountable. You know, we can't get you in office and then you just do whatever and, and now, you know, but we got to now hold people accountable to really making a change. And I'm so proud of this new generation. This new generation is like, we're not doing another 400 years. We've done that. We've done, and so they are really, let's kick the doors down and really make something to make a difference. So I commend the new generation. I commend all the people that are, are listening to this and watching this movie. Again, I commend Kwame, thank you so much. I think this is awesome and an awesome forum and we need to do more things like this and have these open and candid conversations. Yes, uh, this is gonna be a monthly thing. So we'll definitely set something up and I'll be in touch with everybody. What I wanna add to what Stephanie said is white people need to talk to their white politicians, mm -hmm. yes. uh, their white business people. Mm -hmm. They need to talk to they're uh, the uh, white people who are really in control and using their hidden hands to actually uh, control what actually happens. Give you a for instance sign, uh, the Elaine massacre here in Arkansas, 1919, the same families that uh, perpetrated that massacre are still in charge in Elaine 101 year later. A and, lot of places are like that. Yes. Yeah. yeah. So uh, not, only do, of not only do white people need to talk to white people, white people need to talk to the white people that we, that 
will need to concede power and concede right. wealth and concede truth. Period. <laughs> And support and support the two Democrats in Georgia that need to be in the oh Senate. Oh my gosh! Yes, absolutely, hundred percent. Yes, indeed. Yes, indeed. With that, I'll say good night. I need everyone to go to the Coming to the Table website at www.comingtothetable.org. You need to join uh, a chapter of Coming to the Table that is near you. If there is no chapter near you, do like I did and start one. Thank you, have a good night.